Thank you, Seth, and good morning. This uh, Sunday is kind of special for me. 41 years ago today, I was married in this place. And uh, it reminds me of a biography that was written about Jonathan Edwards' wife, Sarah Edwards, titled Marriage to a Difficult Man. And uh, so if you see my wife uh, later this morning, congratulate her for her amazing perseverance. But it's been a great 41 years for me. Well, 42 is the uh, verse that we're beginning with this morning in Mark 15. We're, as you can see, coming to the end of uh, our studies in the Gospel of Mark. And this morning we come to this uh, very significant event of the burial of Jesus. We begin, when evening had already come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. And he gathered up courage and went in before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time, and summoning the centurion, he questioned him as to whether he was already dead. And ascertaining this from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Joseph bought a linen cloth, took him down, wrapped him in the cloth, and laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were looking on to see where he was laid. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in word of prayer. In August of 1914, on the eve of World War I, what they would call the Great War, the British Foreign Secretary, Sir Edward Gray, stared out the window of his office at the street lamps below that were being lit. He turned to his friend and said, the lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime." That was the despair of the disciples when the Lord's body was taken down from the cross and buried in a tomb. The light of the world had gone out and they felt they would never see it again. Jesus had called his disciples the light of the world in Matthew chapter 5, but their lamps had gone dark. The gloom of hopelessness overshadowed the events of our passage. And yet, it's in the midst of that gloom that we see individuals step forward with courage to put their lives on the line for Christ. So this event of the Lord's burial gives us a very human story and one that offers encouragement. But it's also an event that has theological importance. You might wonder how that is. Uh, the death of Christ is important, we know that, but how is his burial? And yet the apostles and early theologians indicate its importance. For example, the Apostles' Creed, which wasn't written by the apostles, but is one of the earliest statements of faith by the church, refers to it. It states a belief in the Trinity, and then about Christ, it states that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Paul included his burial in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. 
These verses uh, in 1 Corinthians 15 have been described as the core doctrines of Christianity. Paul didn't invent the message. This isn't his message. He received it, he said. And this early summary of the church's teaching about Christ included his burial, which Paul described as being of first importance. Well, why is that? That's what we'll consider this morning as we examine the burial of Jesus, but I'll give three simple reasons the burial of Christ is important. First, it proved that Jesus really died. Second, the burial fulfilled scripture. And third, it has implications for our burial. We want to consider each of these points, but first we need to look at Mark's account of the Lord's burial. And again, in that account, we have a very human story of sorrow and fear, but also of great courage. It occurred late on Friday afternoon. Jesus died in the third, or rather the ninth hour, which is three o'clock. Normally his body would have been taken off the cross, carried to a potter's field, and tossed into a common unmarked grave. There was no one present to claim the body. The disciples had deserted him with the exception of John. They had all gone into hiding. Only a few women from Galilee had come to watch the crucifixion. They stood some distance away. All were afraid of the authorities. They were worried for their lives. And they were in despair. They just witnessed the end of a perfect life. The Lord had given them great hope. But now he was gone. The light had been snuffed out. Their hope was dead. Then we read in verse 42 that a man stepped forward. His name was Joseph. He was from the town of Arimathea. He went to the governor, asked for the body, and gave it a decent burial. Nothing's known of Joseph outside of this event. But what we learn from the other Gospels is that he was an unusual man who did a courageous thing. Matthew calls him a rich man. But he was also a man of influence. Mark describes him here as a prominent member of the council, which means a member of the Sanhedrin. His advice was sought. His opinions carried weight. And it wasn't just his wealth that gave him prominence. Luke tells us that he was a good and righteous man. So he was a man of integrity. He was good. He was well respected. But in the case of Jesus, he was in conflict with his colleagues on the court. Luke stated that he had not consented to the plan and action. He had not consented with their plan to put him uh, on trial and put him to death. And he was evidently absent from those events, from that trial. He would have opposed the action taken, and there's no record of any dissent from anyone on the council. So probably he was not informed of the trial and was not there. They knew his opinions. They knew where he stood. And so he hadn't been informed of it. The Sanhedrin wanted a unanimous verdict in a trial that was illegal. And they wouldn't have gotten that if Joseph Joseph had been there. He was a good and righteous man. But his righteousness was not self-originated. It was the product of an encounter that Joseph had with Jesus. Somewhere he had met or heard Christ and put and heard that the, believed in the truth of his message and put his faith in him. He believed what he said. Both Matthew and John reveal that he 
had become a disciple of Jesus. The Holy Spirit had brought him to faith and he was justified. Credited with the righteousness of Christ. He was righteous. But though he was a disciple, John tells us that he was a secret one for fear of the Jews. He had believed in Jesus as the Savior and Messiah. Mark says in verse 43 that he was waiting for the kingdom of God. But like so many people in this story of the, the greatest event of history... Joseph had a conflicted conscience over God's truth and his own reputation. A conflict between faith and fear. And fear got the upper hand, as it so often does. So he kept silent. But where there's true faith, it can only be kept a secret for so long. And for Joseph, the change came when he witnessed the crucifixion. Now, the text does not state that he was there at the cross, but it seems impossible for him to have done all that he did in the short time that he had if he had not been present. And as he witnessed the events at Calvary, heard the Lord's seven sayings from the cross, something happened. He became ashamed of his hypocrisy and stepped forward publicly. Now that took great courage. And Mark indicates that when he speaks of it. But it took great courage because he had to be prepared in doing that to sacrifice everything that he had. His place on the council, his friendships there and outside of the council, maybe even his membership in the synagogue, sacrifice all of that in order to bury Jesus. But that's what he does. Mark writes in verse 43 that he gathered up courage. He did this the risky thing. He gathered up courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. We know from John's Gospel that he wasn't alone. Nicodemus was with him, at least Nicodemus was with him in the burial. And uh, Nicodemus was a man much like Joseph. And John 3, we're all familiar with the interview that he had with our Lord, the account of the conversation that Nicodemus had with Jesus. It happened at night. He was too afraid of the Jewish authorities, with his own, afraid of his own colleagues to visit Jesus in the daytime, in the open, so he went under cover of darkness. And Jesus told him that in order to enter the kingdom of God, a person must be born again. That happens by God's grace. Through a, a work of the Holy Spirit in connection with the message of the cross. And Jesus spoke of that. He spoke of the cross when he said that he would be lifted up just as Moses had lifted up the brass serpent in the wilderness. And you know that story from the book of Numbers, that uh, the fiery serpents entered the camp of Israel because of their sin and began to uh, strike at the Israelites and many began to die. And so Moses cries out for a remedy and God tells him to make a serpent and put it on a staff and all who look at it will be healed of the deadly venom. And of course, that's a picture of what happens to the believer as he looks at Christ as the crucified Savior. It is the remedy for the venom of sin. And he spoke of that to Nicodemus. So Nicodemus left pondering all of this, pondering the Lord's words about grace, about the sovereign grace of God and regeneration and the new birth and and the gospel of the cross. And yet we're left wondering if he was ever born again. We're not told that he was. But we do read later in John in chapter 7 of Nicodemus defending the Lord before the priests and Pharisees. So he comes before us throughout the gospels. And his involvement now with Joseph in the Lord's burial 
which took a great deal of courage, as much courage for Nicodemus as it did for Joseph would suggest to us that he was a man who put his faith in Christ. He was born again, that he believed. And perhaps too, we could say of him, he was waiting for the kingdom of God. So now both of these men who had failed to stand publicly with Christ in his life will now stand with him in his death. Mark states that Joseph's request for the body surprised Pidal. Well, it surprised him. We're told that he wondered when he heard that, that uh, Jesus had died so soon. It, it's very unusual that that would happen. Usually it took days for a man to die on the cross. The Lord had died in a few hours. To hasten the death of the other two, the Romans broke their legs. They didn't, the Jews did not want these corpses or these men dying on the Sabbath, and so they had to remove them before the Sabbath. And that's what they did with those two, but they didn't with our Lord. Um, Jesus had died before that happened. Just as the Passover lamb, whose bones were not to be broken, not one of his bones were broken. Perfect picture of our Lord in that sacrificed lamb and our Lord's sacrifice. When his death was confirmed to Pilate, he released the body to Joseph who went to the site of the crucifixion, lowered the cross and pulled the nails out of his hands and feet. He and Nicodemus had to act quickly. It was already late in the afternoon. The, uh, the Sabbath was about to begin and they had to complete their work before that happened. The Sabbath begins at sundown. Sundown would have been about 8 o'clock in the evening, and so the burial preparations were done hastily. They washed the body. They wrapped it in a new clean linen cloth that Joseph had bought. The uh, two men then carried it into the garden nearby and laid it in a tomb that had been cut into the rock. It was a new tomb. Luke wrote that it was one in which no one had ever lain. Matthew states that it was Joseph's tomb. It was a brave act because this is a very public identification with the Lord. Not only does he claim the body, not only does he bury the body, but he buries it in his own tomb, which would have been an expensive tomb. It would have jeopardized, as you can see, his relationship with his colleagues, with Nicodemus's colleagues, and their place on the court. But they were ready for that. They were ready to suffer rejection for him. It was an act of love. It was an act of courage. But it was not one of faith or hope. They prepared the body for a long stay in the tomb, rolled a stone against the entrance and went home to observe the Sabbath and mourn without anticipating the resurrection on Sunday. Watching all of this were the women of Galilee. They had followed Joseph and Nicodemus to the tomb so they would know where the body was laid. Uh, then Luke says they went home to prepare spices and perfumes to bring back to the tomb after the Sabbath on Sunday morning to complete the burial. That too was um, an act of courage. It was an act of love, but not one of hope. What none of these people realized is that all of this was according to God's purpose and fulfilled prophecy. So there are important lessons to be learned from the burial of Christ. First, his burial was the conclusive proof that he died. It gives historical evidence of that fact. And why is that important? Well, it's important because if Christ did not die on the cross, then there is no hope and there is no gospel. Only his sacrificial death could pay man's debt to God and remove our sin and guilt. Why is that important? 
Why must he die? The world asks that question. I read that just, just yesterday. A question that someone had asked about this, the gospel, the whole story didn't make sense to this individual. And he asked the question, why did he need to die? Well, I suppose if he were simply a moral philosopher, it wouldn't have made sense that he had to die. But of course he was not. He is the son of God. And the very fact that someone would ask that question betrays a lack of appreciation and understanding of just how great sin is and just how holy God is. He's absolutely holy and sin disrupts any relationship we can have with Him and sin is so bad, so grievous that it takes the Son of God's death to remove it. If He had not died... We have no forgiveness and no hope of resurrection ourselves. His sermons, his miracles, his obedience to the law, an example of perfection would not be of any help to us. If he did not die on the cross, there's no atonement. We're still in our sins. Only his sacrificial death saves But we have here proof that puts his death beyond dispute. His burial. I say puts it on beyond dispute. There have been some who have questioned the Lord's death on the cross. Notably, skeptics in the 19th century who invented a variety of explanations for the empty tomb. There's a whole list of these, and the 19th century, late 18th century, I guess, started this with the Enlightenment and rationalism. Uh, the first uh, example of a, uh, of a story that contradicts this is from the priests themselves, where they said, uh, spread the story that the disciples stole the tomb. There are difficulties with that that make it a, an impossible thing to believe, but Some of the later ones, these views of the 19th century were uh, explanations given to explain away the empty tomb. And as I say, these were rationalists, people who denied the supernatural and the possibility of miracles and tried to explain the report that we find here the account of the burial and resurrection of our Lord naturalistically. And so they gave their theories. And one of those is, as you have all heard, I'm sure, the swoon theory, that Jesus uh, was not dead, that he fainted on the cross and was only thought to be dead, was then buried, and in the cool of the tomb... He revived, he walked out, he presented himself to the disciples and was able to convince his followers that he was resurrected and had conquered death. Well, there are obvious problems with that. First, it's unlikely, to put it mildly, that anyone would survive a crucifixion, especially after a spear was thrust in his side. But it's equally absurd that having survived such a trauma that he could could convince his followers that his resuscitation was a resurrection. Resurrection is not simply coming back to life. It It is glorification. Well, none of these attempts to explain away the Lord's death and resurrection are successful. They really carry conviction with people who deny that God is personal and active in the affairs of men, they they carry conviction only with people who want to believe them because they don't want to believe what the record says or look at the evidence. But there's plenty of evidence to support this very thing. The four Gospels themselves are historical documents that give historical evidence of the death and resurrection of Christ. They give names and witnesses to his death and burial. That's evidence. And their participation, these people who are mentioned here, 
especially that of the Galilean women, dispels another of these rationalistic theories uh, against the resurrection, and that the women went to the wrong tomb on Sunday morning. There's no evidence of that. In fact, just the contrary. They followed Joseph to the tomb. They witnessed the burial. They knew the precise place where it took, where it took place. So historically, in terms of evidence for the truth of this, uh, this event of the Lord's death, the burial is important. But secondly, it's also important as the fulfillment of Scripture. In Isaiah 53, verse 9, the prophecy of the burial of the servant of the Lord is given. Servant of the Lord isn't identified, but we know who he is. He's speaking of our Lord. And Isaiah said of him, His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Mark doesn't say that the Lord's burial occurred in fulfillment of Isaiah 53 verse 9. But Matthew said that Joseph was a rich man and Jesus was laid in his own new tomb, in the tomb of Joseph. So putting all of that together, it's clear that this is the fulfillment of that prophecy in Isaiah. And the unusual events of the burial show that it happened in a providential way. I might say a miraculous way in order to bring about the fulfillment. Normally, a man who was a blasphemer and a criminal, as Jesus was accused of being, would not be given a decent burial. The body would have been uh, disposed of in a common grave with other criminals. Isaiah said his grave was assigned with wicked men. So that was the plan of the Sanhedrin, to bury him in a common grave with other criminals, unmarked, unknown. But a rich man became a disciple, even one who was a member of the Sanhedrin, and he got the courage to claim the body and contribute his own tomb to his burial. God's hand was in all of this. So secondly, this is a, another example of fulfilled prophecy, which is profound proof of the truth of this record, of what is recorded here. And thirdly, the Lord's burial was important theologically for a number of reasons. It is, uh, first significance is that the Lord's burial was the conclusion of his humiliation. Paul writes of that humiliation in Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, where he wrote that Jesus emptied himself by becoming a man, and not just a man, but a bondservant, a slave, as it were. That was a great condescension, a great humiliation. But then he stooped even lower. Paul writes, when he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, even death on that painful, shameful cross that was reserved only for the worst of criminals. That was, that was humiliation. He humbled himself for that. But now, the completion of that self-humiliation occurs, and it was self-humiliation. He willingly suffered all of this. But the end of it occurred when he was laid in the grave. That was sort of a, a period to the end of the sentence. And that was necessary because that is the end of the judgment on sin. The, the full penalty that God pronounced on sin. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, God said to Adam when he pronounced judgment on him, By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. 
And so the sinless Son of Man suffered this final penalty for our sin. He was laid in the grave. An unclean place, a place of corruption. The humiliation of it is seen symbolically in the fact that with the the burial of the body, the body goes down into the earth. That's the opposite of going up. That's the opposite of being exalted. So just the just the picture that it gives is one of humiliation, not exaltation. And what a place for the Son of God to be in the dust of death. It seemed to be a denial of all that he claimed to be. To all appearances, he was just a man after all. That was a great humiliation. But all of this was necessary since he was our our representative in judgment. Since he took our place, he had to take on the full consequences of sin. Drink the cup of wrath down to the dregs, fully, completely, and be placed in a tomb, returned to the ground. And yet, while the Lord's burial was the conclusion of His humiliation, it was also the beginning of His exaltation. The grave is the place of corruption. But Psalm 16, verse 10, stated that God would not allow His Holy One to undergo decay. In Acts chapter 2, Peter quoted that verse as a prophecy of the Lord's resurrection and points out that his tomb is empty. David, who wrote that, wasn't writing about himself. He said, his tomb is still with us. You can go check it. You can go see it. But Christ is no longer in the tomb. So Jesus' body did not suffer corruption in the tomb. And the tomb in which he was laid was a fitting one for God's Holy One. It was a witness to His holy nature. That tomb itself was and a witness to His sacred mission. Luke described it as a tomb where no one had ever lain. Decay had never entered it. It was a fit resting place for the body of God's Holy One. And He remained holy even in the grave. It did not conquer him. He would conquer it in the resurrection and conquer it not simply for himself, but for us. Because through his burial, he removed the terrors of the grave. We're all going to the same place. We're going to the coffin, to corruption, to dust. We don't like to think of that, but that's the reality. Most people shrink from it. But the fact is, the grave swallows everyone. Even Christ went there. He was buried. But he went there to conquer the grave so that he could save his people from it. And he did it. He survived. He triumphed. That's the good news of the gospel. He has removed the terrors of the tomb for the redeemed and has purified it for us. It is now where our bodies rest, sleep, as Paul says, and wait for the resurrection. So the burial of Jesus is very meaningful. Those who performed the burial did it with a lot of love, but very little hope. For them, the lamp of the world had gone out. And yet, it was a hopeful event. It was the conclusion of Jesus' humiliation and the beginning of His exaltation. He descended into the earth in order to ascend into heaven. And that too will be the experience of all who put their faith in Him, of all who join themselves to Jesus Christ as our Savior and our sacrifice through faith and faith alone. So when we lay hold of that, we have great hope. We have eternal hope. So when we lay a loved one in the grave or contemplate our date with death, we can remember that Christ has been there. He's gone before us. And He has triumphed over us. 
and over it, and so will we. But there's another lesson here, and we learn that from Joseph. When he identified with Jesus, he showed courage and no doubt lost a lot, lost his seat on the Sanhedrin and lost many friends. But when he carried the crucified body of Christ, he gave a picture of the Christian life. That's what we are to be doing. Identifying with Christ crucified. Taking up our cross. In Hebrews 13 verse 12, we are reminded that Christ suffered outside the city in order to sanctify us, to set us apart from the world. Then the writer tells us, go outside the camp bearing his reproach. Joseph and Nicodemus did that literally. They went outside the city and bore the reproach of Christ. That's a challenge, but they cared more about Christ, more about his body than they did about the world's approval. And of course, that is to be true of us as well. We are to care less about the world's approval than we are about the Lord's. We're to carry the Lord's cross as those men carried his corpse. We're to be public. The way to get that courage, because I don't think any of us have that naturally, the way to get it is to consider the cross. That's where Joseph and Nicodemus got their courage. The, the small spark of faith they had was kindled into a burning lamp at the foot of the cross. And as we consider all that Christ did for us, all that Christ gained for us at Calvary, that He suffered for us and was buried for us to give life forever and victory over the grave, that should produce within us gratitude that produces courage and action. And what's more, He is alive. Three days after his burial, he left the tomb to fill the world with his light, the light of life, the light of eternal life. In Matthew 5, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus called his disciples the light of the world. They're the light of the world because they bear his light. They reflect his light, his truth. And they were not to hide their lamp under a basket, he says, but lift it up high. Let it shine before men. Whatever lamps or lights the world has, whatever wisdom and hope that it offers or gives is ephemeral. It's temporary. It doesn't last. Peace is never permanent in this world. Health and prosperity are always fleeting. All is destined for the grave. It's a dead end in this world. You are destined for the grave. Are you going there with hope or with despair? The good news is Christ has gone before you and has removed the terrors of the grave for all who attach themselves to Him, for all who believe in Him. He bore our sins so that we would escape the consequences of those sins. So come to Christ if you have not. Believe in Him. Lay hold of Him through faith in who He is and what He has done. Recognize that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, the only Savior, and in doing that, you will be saved. And then be a lamp. You are a lamp at that moment. These are dark days. But no time for despair. It's time to shine. The disciples did. They came out of hiding and the living Christ lit their lamps so that they turned the world upside down with the gospel. May we do the same. May God give us courage to be bold in our faith. Think on the cross. Think of what He's done for you. May God help us all to do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this text. 
And we could easily read about the burial and move on to the resurrection, but there's much here to instruct us of your grace and your mercy to us. Uh, that the Lord suffered this final bit of humiliation and did so for us. And because He did, we will escape the grave. We may enter it, but it's not a place to fear any longer. It's a place of rest as we enter heaven itself and await the resurrection from the grave. We do that. We have that hope because of your Son. We thank you for Him. Thank you for all that we have in Christ. And it's in His name we pray. Amen.